pleasure to be here. Um, so one of the advantages or disadvantages of being the residual claimant of such a, such a fine panel is um, many things that I was going to say have been said, and fortunately for you, better than I would have said them. So um, I would like to make a few observations about digital platforms and, and return to a couple of comments uh, about the Amex case. Um, so one of the things I would like to do is set digital platforms into the discussion of innovation that occurred in the first panel. Um, and some of the issues that arose there, for example, regarding data. Um, I do think that one of the, you know, as has been said very often, one of the key functions uh, of a digital platform or multi-sided market is matching. And I want to come back to that because I think we need to be fairly precise about what we mean by matching if we're going to differentiate a two-sided market from a market of, you know, a very common kind of market in which there's an intermediary. But um, one of the things that happens when you have matching is that you need increased amounts of information to improve your matching over time. And so data and the use of data to feed into a matching algorithm tends to be a key function of almost every digital platform you can think of. Um, Facebook matching users with content or people that might be of interest to them or dogs that might be um, hiding from them. Um, uh, uh, Google matching people's queries with what will best answer that query. Uh, Amazon matching people with goods, but also increasingly matching advertisers with users. Amazon is becoming a major advertising platform as well. So one of the things that we see in digital platforms that's an important characteristic is that information or let's start with data, is a key part of, a key input into production. Um, data is constantly fed into algorithms, which are constant, constantly changing uh, to constantly improve uh, uh, the matching function that occurs. So in that sense, one interesting characteristic of digital platforms is that there is very little difference between R&D and the production function. Research and development in improving the algorithm is effectively the same thing as changing the product, which is in fact the match that these uh, that these uh, platforms are producing. Um, so, you know, in that sense, sure, data is in many kinds of industries an input of production, and R and D is related to production. I think we get a greater identity of R and D and the production function when it comes to a lot of these digital platforms, and indeed data may be among the most key inputs. Uh, so data, innovation, uh, R&D, production tend to uh, come together in, in, in a much more uh, unified way for digital platforms and in many other uh, contexts. Um, I think another uh, important aspect of digital platforms is they don't stay still. You know, you heard Aaron talk about B-Press um, in its Espresso product standing still and discovering itself bypassed by Scholastica. Um, that is something that I think most digital platforms probably feel day to day. If you actually look empirically, and I want to echo Aviv's plea for more empirical work, but if you look empirically, actually every year there are a bunch of new apps or entrants into various parts of the digital marketplace that surge briefly and then fall. If you look at the beginning of any school year, there are social media apps that get millions of users and then they fade. We can talk about the reasons that they fade, um, but there, do, there, there is, I think, regular entry and pressure on digital platforms. The result is that innovation becomes not a periodic, um, a, a sort of regular but periodic and discrete process, but a, continu a continuous process. Firms are constantly innovating, and that ties very closely to what's happening with the almost daily or hourly updating uh, of, of algorithms. And you can find lots of specific examples. Um, updating matching algorithms on something like Facebook. Uh, updating um, real-time search data such that advertisements uh, connect better with users on Google. There are lots of examples of this. So you have a continuous and ongoing innovation process. Um, 
which is driven partly just by the nature of the algorithms that drive a lot of digital platforms, but is also, uh, I think, driven by uh, the reality of uh, regular attempts to enter uh, markets. And I'll say something about where I think that comes from, uh, where that pressure uh, comes from. Okay, so if this is what we're seeing um, in, in, uh, in digital uh, platforms, it's a difference of, I think, degree, not a difference of kind in the way innovation is done. What about what these platforms do? Um, to be sure, the platforms are intermediaries, whether they're pure agents that might stand between buyers and sellers, or actually do some kind of uh, more um, uh, tailored matching, is, is again, I think this gets very, very much to Guy's point, um, something that is not sort of discrete. You don't have, you know, pure agents versus you know pure uh, matching entities. Um, and you might think about the difference between Facebook and a grocery store. The grocery store is an intermediary. It brings customers into the store and puts an array of products in front of them. There is, in some sense, um, a connection. More people are going to come to a grocery store that has more products. More products are going to come into a grocery store that is likely to have more different kinds of consumers coming in, much like the dynamic uh, Aaron described when he was trying to create uh, his law review uh, submission uh, product. But is that really a cross network effect? Is that really, that's nothing new. That is something that all kinds of intermediaries have tried to do in all kinds of marketplaces for millennia. And I would worry if the mere fact that there is a feedback effect or some connection between the number of players on one side of the market and the number of players on another side of the market suddenly put that entity into a completely new kind of legal regime. Because then I think we, uh, we wind up uh, getting very confused and applying, um, and I'll come back to Amex, the Amex kinds of rules to all kinds of enter, ent entities where, where there really isn't any kind of serious connection between the two sides other than that each side wants to see a lot of volume or a lot of quantity on the other side of the market. What I think is interesting about digital platforms and what makes them difference, different in degree is the degree to which they actually focus on matching users on each side of the market, as opposed to simply putting them in front of each other. A grocery store doesn't really make a lot of effort to match. It makes some effort, but not a lot of effort. It gives you a coupon when you leave that reflects the things that you've already purchased so that you maybe find that coupon of interest and it attracts you back to the store. But by and large, what a grocery store is doing is putting a lot of competing products in front of you, bringing a lot of con consumers in uh, to choose among those competing products and largely leaving them alone to make their decisions. What is different about a digital platform in degree is the extent to which it actually tries to customize the match between the two sides of the market. Uh, and that is where I think we can actually get some, uh, some differences or, or some connections in the welfare functions of the two sides of the market. To be sure, as a seller of a cereal, breakfast cereal, my welfare is higher if I know that more customers are going to come and see my breakfast cereal. But to the extent that I am using a platform that is best able to actually pull a particular customer in front of my product, I'm willing to invest quite a bit more in that platform to actually buy that match. My welfare is then quite tied up in the algorithm and what the uh, what the platform is doing. Similarly, as a consumer, I like a grocery store with lots of different products, but I might really like one that has invested in innovating in making my shopping much more efficient by taking me from item to item without having me scan and search and doing the match for me. I think as we move into the kinds of platforms that are more than, that, that, that cross the line from being mostly intermediaries that just put buyers and sellers in front of each other, to being uh, uh, intermediaries that match and curate specific relationships, uh, we spill into, I think, a very different kind of entity from the kinds of you know, very common intermediary businesses that we see. <coughs> What's challenging about this is I think it can be hard, empirically, 
to determine where people is going across the line from an intermediary that puts buyers and sellers in front of each other to one that really mostly invests in curating the match. We want to protect the innovation in the latter, perhaps more than we want to protect the innovation in the former, because the innovation in the constant updating of the match is really the product that is being uh, provided. So we might have a very different view about the role of data in uh, a, a digital platform market than the role of data in, say, you know, a regular consumer goods market. And we might have very different views, and it could be views that cut both ways about the importance of letting platforms use data, but also the, uh, uh, right along with that, the extent to which data creates barriers of entry uh, into those platforms. Uh, so I do think that there are some important differences um, uh, in, in, in degree, but not in kind, between the kinds of digital two-sided markets we're talking about and conventional kinds of intermediary markets. Um, because these are differences of degree and not differences in kind, I agree completely with Aaron that the tools and the economic analyses that we have are probably well suited to addressing uh, a lot of the problems that arise in two-sided markets. Um, what's important is getting the empirics right and understanding that um, the, the welfare consequences of actions on one side of a market for the other side of the market are going to differ depending on the extent of matching that is being invested in and done by the platform. To conclude with the Amex case, what bothers me about the Amex case is a legal rule, and one that I would hate to see expanded into more jurisdictions or sort of become the, the sort of uh, common way of thinking about um, uh, analyzing welfare in digital platform markets, is I think that it uh, creates a distinction that is much more discreet, very much to Guy's point uh, earlier, um, than uh, the facts of the economics would really support. Uh, the court, the U.S. Supreme Court there said that for two-sided markets with cross-network effects, a plaintiff can't just show harm on one side of the market, anti-competitive conduct on one side of the market. They have to also take into account in their welfare analysis, if you will, their claim of net harm, the other side of the market. So the harm to merchants might well be offset by the gain to cardholders through the points that they get for, you know, and, and the, the benefit programs, the reward programs that they get on different cards. Um, so it is up to a plaintiff to now come in and show that somehow these two very incommensurate things, uh, harm, to, harm to merchants and benefits to card uh, members uh, somehow lead to a net negative. Um, that's a very hard thing to do. Knowing where to limit the application of this broader burden on plaintiffs, I think is a very hard thing to know. So um, I think the better way for the court to have done, and the reason that I think the substantive rule is incorrect, is they should have just had left the burden where it is on every kind of competition case in most jurisdictions to show harm on one side of the market. And if there was an offsetting gain, it is an efficiency defense that the platform could bring to bear, and they are going to have the information to provide that, that defense much more easily than, than the platform. Thanks, Howard. Okay, so... Um